Thanks for downloading this episode of Cork Talk with me, Tim Atkin. A weekly conversation with some of the most famous people in the world of wine. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Noma Cork by Vinventions. Driven by a commitment to innovation, the new plant-based Noma Cork Green Line offers significant improvements in wine closure performance. Thanks to a rigorous oxygen ingress rate, you can decide which cork is best for your wine whether it's for young and fresh wines or for those with ageing potential. Alvaro Espinosa's dad was a winemaker, but it wasn't automatic that his son would follow the same career path. He nearly became a marine biologist, as it happens. What an impact Alvaro has had on his country's wine scene, producing Chile's first Carmen Air and being the person who brought biodynamic viticulture to South America. Now running his own project, Antial, in the Maipo Andes, he's a fascinating interviewee. Hey, Alvaro, how are you? Hi, Tim. Thanks very much for, for the time. Uh, very well. I'm here in the, in the house, you know, near the, near the winery in the vineyard. And we have a beautiful uh, rainy night and a uh, rainy day. So we're quite happy, you know, how we miss the rain here in, in Chile. Because Chile's had a series of very dry vintages, isn't it? Yeah, the last uh, maybe 15 years we have been uh, with a very, very, very heavy dry Listen, I think at the end, I'd, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about climate change and biodynamics and whether biodynamic viticulture deals with climate change better. But I, I want to start, I often do this by asking people a little bit about their, about their upbringing. And you are unusual that your dad, Mario, was also an enologist. So did you know from a young age that you too would become a winemaker? Yeah, not really. You know, when when you are young, but I I was the youngest son of the family, so most of my time I was uh, I was like the, the the only son in the in the house because my my brother and sister married earlier, so I pass a lot of time with my my fathers. Uh, but you know, when you are young, you are a little more rebel. You want to do different things. I was very close to the ocean. I love to go to go to the beach to do sports. And, uh, and I was always very close to, to study uh, marine biology. That was ah, like okay. my first, uh, I, I love biology, biochemistry. I, I, I like those things. And, and uh, you know, we were a beautiful coast. But at that time, you know, it's four years you can study uh, marine biology. It wasn't, a, you know, a, a lot of work at that time in, in that subjects. So it, uh, it was hard to study that. So... I didn't have the, the, the time. I had to wait a couple of years to start studying if I wanted to do it. So I started agronomy because my father was an agronomist and I loved the, the nature. I loved to be in the country, in the countryside. So I study uh, agronomy without knowing too much. I, when you study a career, you start uh, liking different subjects, you know, like uh, animals. Then the uh, fruit industry was booming at that time in Chile. You know, m- most of my friends were in the fruit industry. And, uh, but then uh, I, I think so. my father was a big influence. And when I was a child, I always go to the, to the old wineries, you know, with the, and always uh, impress me the, the, the aromas, you know, not, not beautiful aromas, huh? All, all very humid aromas, but it was strong, you know, like, <laughs> you like the, the smell of, of wineries. Yeah. <laughs> it was strong. Yeah. I like the smell of the wineries. And then, uh, I have, I think I also, I have good, good teachers, you know, like my father was my teacher in enology, but also my, I think one of my mentor was, uh, Felipe de, de Solminiac, that he was my teacher in the university and he gave me the first job. Also, yeah, but it was interesting because you studied enology in, in Chile first of all at Catolica, yeah, university. But then you went to Bordeaux, uh, and that was quite unusual, wasn't it, in those days for somebody to go and study in France? Did, did, was that a big time in your life, an important time in your life? Yeah, yeah, very important. I was just telling you that uh, Felipe was the one that really motivated me because he went to make the same thing that he studied in, in Bordeaux enology. And uh, and he gave me the first job, and I started working with him. and uh, And it was so bad the, the the wine industry at that time. You know, it's uh, all the all the the wineries were going in bankrupt, and it was uh, having a, a lot of uh, problems. You know, uh, economically in, uh, at, at that time. So to be uh, 
to study wine making wasn't a, really a good a good <laughs> it's a good idea a good thing a good <laughs> idea so <laughs> so my father uh, told me that's a good moment to go studying huh? mm. and he pushed me and he helped me to go to studying in uh, in Bordeaux uh, and it was like the and uh, and it was very very important for me especially to live in another country to to be alone well, I was with my wife we mm. we was just married with Marida and we were starting our our life together you know and it was nice to be in, in another country without mm. without family without friends just just the two of us, you know, it was, it was good times. A new adventure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you went back to Chile, didn't you? You went to, to Domaine Oriental to start with, and then you got the job at Viña Carmen where you made your name, really. I think you joined there in, what, 1992, 93. Um, how did you get the job at Viña Carmen? It was, was quite unusual because uh, I was in the in Talca region at that time. Uh, you know, Maipo was the main, main valley for for top wines and uh, and my my dream was to work it, at Santa Rita huh? when I was coming back from uh, from Bordeaux, but it was not the time. And uh, at the end, uh, I t- I tried to find a job in the wine industry and it was very tough. But these guys from uh, Domaine Oriental gave me the possibility to start doing wines there. And while we were doing working at Domaine Oriental, we received uh, the Brown Foreman group, you know, that they were searching for a winery to represent in the United States Mm -hmm. and was a big group, you know, the the people from uh, Jack Daniels, uh, Mm -hmm. Brown Foreman, Mm -hmm. and uh, they visit us in Domain Oriental and we have a very good uh, feelings, you know, and uh, I present the wines and everything like that, but we were too small. They were looking for a big winery and at the end they, they, they make the agreement with Carmen Vineyards, you know, the, from the Santa Rita group. Mm. And then they came, the, they asked them uh, which winemaker that they had been visiting all Chile, they will choose to do the wines for Carmen. And they gave my name. So, so the general manager of, uh, of Santa Rita, Raimundo Alenzuela, called me. He didn't tell, <laughs> he didn't tell me that at, at after you know <laughs> so i cannot negotiate very well but uh, he offered me the, the the possibility to be the the head winemaker at carmen and uh, and it was a huge opportunity to go in uh, this santa rita group and and i took it also and so you got to santa rita in the end was yeah. like that. <laughs> from, from a different route at the end i returned yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the end i yeah. I went to Santa Rita, not really Santa Rita. It was Carmen Vineyard, Carmen, but it door. was close, the same farm, the same yeah. people. Yeah. I mean, in 1994, you just arrived, really, hadn't you? And and you know, you arrived the year before, and um, you made this first Carmenero that was called Grand Vidur, and I think it was in the Vigne Carmen vineyards that the French academic Monsieur Bossico saw Carmenero. Right? As, uh, did you know that Carmenero and Merlot were different grapes? No, no, we, we were always talk about the, the early Merlot and the late ripening Merlot. Yeah? It was like two different, uh, but the same Merlot. There was like, we, we, we didn't have a, a clue about uh, what was going on. But because I was talking, because I, I study in France and I know French, I have uh, the, the commitment to, to visit with the Monsieur Boursico, the different uh, uh, blocks of vines and, uh, and talk with him. And, he, and when we sh- show him the best Merlot block that he was giving us the, the re- Grand Reserva Merlot, uh, we were shocked because he told us it was not Merlot. It was a, a, another old variety, Carmenet. Oh. And, uh, and we were like very young. I was 32 years old and uh, the export manager was pretty much the same age and we were very like... Uh, how you say competitive and uh, mm. and we were trying to find new 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 varieties for the Chilean uh, wine industry and suddenly we discover an old an old one that nobody Carmener nobody has it and uh, we bottle and we put it in the in in the, in the label we cannot put Carmener because it was Carmen Carmener was sounds like you know not like very, Viña Carmen yeah <laughs> yeah like Viña Carmen yeah so at the end uh, we put it the the synonym uh, that the old days, Grande Vidure. And you ah, know the story a vidure, afterwards. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you also, when you were there, you were plant, you planted what was, I think, Chile's first organic vineyard. It, and it was what, it was like two acres. It was it was 
eight hectares, yeah? yeah. And what inspired yeah. you to plant that first organic vineyard? You were doing a lot, weren't you, for a young man? Yeah, you know, I, I always was very uh, close to organic farming. I, I practices in the university, like uh, orchard farm, organic farming, and uh, like in small places. But I was always uh, close to that idea. Huh? And uh, in the Chilean wine in industry, we haven't seen it, you know, uh, organic farming, organic viticulture. But because of Brown Foreman, uh, they they invite me to visit uh, the, the Californian wineries that Brown Foreman owns at that time. They, they were just bought Fetzer huh? mm. with the Bonterra. They were the, the pioneers in Mendocino farming organically. So I I met them. I met Paul Dolan, that, that was the, the president at Fetzer at that time when uh, Brown Foreman bought the the winery, and the Fetzer and they present me the Fetzer family. I met Jimmy Fetzer, Bobby Fetzer. And all they were like maybe 15 years older than me, and they were very in organic farming. And they also showed me the first biodynamic uh, farm, you know. So and, when uh, was this? What year would that, that be? That was, I started going there in 93, 94, yeah. 95, every harvest, a couple of weeks, then a month. And then at the end, in 98, I stay one year there uh, working with Bonterra. And learning about organics. Yeah, I mean that was very important for you, wasn't it? That six months you spent in 1998. I mean that was was that what really convinced you about biodynamics? It was almost uh, a year. It was more than ten months that we stayed there. Huh? Yeah. And with the family, uh, we went there, and I started working in the in the fields, you know, in the vineyards, not the, not in the winery. And I wanted to learn about organics uh, farming. And uh, so it was, yeah, yeah. And, and at that time, I met Alan, Alan York, that he he introduced me to to biodynamics, and uh, we finally were one of my best friends. And uh, he he I, he helped me here also in Chile to to introduce uh, biodynamic farming with Emiliana and, uh, and helping Antillal in my winery also. So, yeah, what's very important that time. I mean, t t t tell us a bit more about Alan. I mean, I met him a couple of times and liked him very much. He was very funny. Um, yeah. Just tell us a bit more about him and his approach to agriculture, because he was he was very unusual in a way, wasn't he? I mean, a lot of people dismissed his ideas. Just tell us a little bit about, about Alan's philosophy on, on, on farming, but also on life, really. Yeah, he was like an uh, idealistic guy, huh? and uh, he was very tough in, in his ideas, and, and he was very serious and in 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 working, you know, and and uh, he was very uh, he was a funny guy. He was always joking and uh, very acid jokes sometimes, you know. But with the jokes, they were always teaching you something. Uh, he, he was uh, really a, a mentor. He he. Help me to see nature in in another way, you know. Uh, so it was uh, quite important, yeah, quite important for me. Yeah, I, me I remember once I said to him, "What did you do in the '60s?" and he said, "A lot of psychedelic drugs." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sadly he passed away so so early. Uh, so 2014, young. he died, didn't he? I think. Yeah, yeah. 2014, yeah. the same the same year that Jose. Yeah. So, so yeah. tell us a bit about Jose in a minute. But so, what was his approach? How did he learn about biodynamics? Had he studied Steiner? Had he had he been to Germany? Had he been to Austria? Well, what did he know about it? No, he studied. He studied. Alan learned in the, in California biodynamics. He he was the, one of the teachers of Alan Chadwick. That he was an Englishman that was working in in California and in anthroposoph anthroposophic uh, philosophy. And he was a farmer also. And he he has like a school of biodynamics in in California, and Alan learned with him, eh? mm. and that he he has a he has a degree in anthroposophy also mm. Alan, and then he started doing uh, uh, working in agriculture. He started with apples. He was a, a apple grower for many years, mm. and then he he go to bankerot uh, <laughs> growing apples. So so he learned he, with his, the wine. he <laughs> learned with his mistakes, you know. Yeah. And then he moves to the to the vine uh, to the vine industry, and he was very mm. very uh, I would say influential in, in in the whole world. Huh? Yeah, he, he, um, it's interesting. I, I yeah I read something. He said that modern modern agriculture will be seen in the future as the shortest lived system that's ever been pursued. Well, what did he mean? Did he mean that the ancient ways were, were, were much better in a sense, were more intuitive? 
Yeah, and it, and he always think that the, this uh, this type of uh, chemical agriculture will will end soon, huh? mm. and uh, and we're we're still uh, working for that, you know. Mm. But uh, uh, yeah, because if you if you think uh, uh, this type conventional or chemical agriculture mm. comes from the nineteen twenties, it's not so far yeah, away. after the First World War. Yeah, first world war. Before yeah. before that yeah. was uh, was organic uh, farming. Yeah. Most of yeah. like also the medicine was was more natural. Uh, after the war was a big uh, big uh, development of of business, and mm. uh, and everything started to be more focused in the business of agriculture, of the business of the of the health. Uh, and uh, and, we and lost so them. those things were yeah were well, those things were what pesticides and herbicides and all those things and fertilizers all those things yeah that that now we are seeing all, all the the bad effects of, of yeah. those type of things you know yeah. uh, the, the pesticides and uh, and the chemicals you know in, on you know, things like, like cancers you mean or, or all in the vineyard yeah, as well yeah. healthiness yeah, yeah, yeah. the the loss of fertility of the soil the the certification of the soil. All those things are coming from that type of seeing the world, you know. But you, you and Alan are two of the only people I've ever met who could explain biodynamics to me very, very clearly. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, you always stress the practical side of biodynamics, and he did that as well. Can you just explain to us, for anybody listening for the first time, you know, what is biodynamics? Yeah. In a few words, that's yeah, not, sorry. not easy, but, but <laughs> when biodynamics come from the, the philosophy and anthroposophy, and uh, it's, uh, it's a way of farming that it's like an organic way of farming, but it has much more uh, com- uh, compromise with nature and with the people that work in, in the fields. Uh, I would say that differentiate from organic farming in three main practical subjects, you know. Mm. The first one is the organization of the farm. In uh, in biodynamics, you have to close the, the unity of production, the, the farm, uh, trying to do farming with minimal inputs inside the farm. Mm. So everything you need to produce grape, or in this case, or food, in, uh, you ha- have to come from the same from the same place, from the same farm. So you have to introduce animals in the system and how to manage the animals and how to work with them and how to work with the manure of the animals to to produce all your compost and to f- keep the fertility of your blocks, you know. Uh, so that idea of uh, self-sustained unity is very related with the expression of the individuality of the farm. When you have a, a, a agricultural system with high inputs, you change the conditions, you standardize, you homologate conditions. So at the end, uh, the farms start to be pretty more similar. Mm. When you have to self-contain the, the, the farm, uh, you can express the the identity uh, of this place, of, of this farm. And that's very uh, related with the expression of terroir in, in, in the wine. So that was the main thing for me that uh, really, uh, how you say, the make me feel in love with biodynamics you know this this sense of be self sufficient i think that you have to be very smart and you have to be very in the farm to 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 try to get that you know and the other two differences with organic is that the, the biodynamics uh, take care of the rhythms the cosmic rhythms and how that affect life in 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 the earth how in nature uh, when the sun the, the influence of the sun is the it's a very dramatic you 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 experiment and the you moon. Know. yeah yeah the moon too, and then yeah. the moon the moon we notice less but it has a big big um, influence in the, by the forces of levity you know in the ocean ties and so we try to work with this movement like in the old days you know when you go to uh, old farmers they they used to take care of the moon rhythms to farm uh, we do the same we have some moments that are more propitious to to do some some works and we try to use that and the third uh, difference with organics that we work uh, the compost and the farm with some preps uh, preparations that are made from uh, natural herbs the same one that you use in uh, in medicine natural medicine or, yeah. in homeopathy mm-hmm. we use it in in the compost to increase the the action of the microbials and, and the life in the compost and uh, the, the, this compost get more alive with more vitality forces. 
and uh, it's better for the soil and it's better for the farm and 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 uh, and we use this these preps like a must you know you like a, like a tea is it yeah yeah it's like yeah. a tea to spray in the compost and also we have a couple of preps that you use it for the for the fields you know to and work with the polarity uh, the, the the earth polarity and the cosmic polarity uh, and life happens between these polarities and uh, we we can increase one or the other forces with these preparations. I mean, some of the things are a bit strange, like the deer bladders that you put up in trees. I remember you telling me once it was very difficult to get red deer bladders in Chile to do it. <laughs> and yet, you yeah. know, the people you work with, your 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 vineyard workers, you said to me that they understood it intuitively because they were used to working with with the seasons and 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 the cosmos, yeah. if you like, and these slightly more spiritual factors. Um, just tell us about the strange bits about biodynamics. Do you just accept those for what they are? The deer's bladders in the trees and things like that. You know, I think when you start practicing, you start understanding. It was that I was formed like an agronomist with science, you know, traditional science. Uh, yeah, it's like a very, very weird, you know, from the things that you study. But when you experiment life, uh, you see that these forces that are working always, you know, and um, and when you are more time with nat in nature, you like that, like the, the people that work in the fields, you know, uh, you experiment this this these forces and this uh, of especially of the cosmic forces, you experiment much uh, in reality when you are maybe much indoor in a city, you start losing this connection. But when you start practicing, they start to be sound very reasonable, you know. The, the, you need to open your mind. Yeah, yeah. bearing yeah. horns with manure, you know, in, uh, that at the beginning you say, why you, I am doing this yeah. thing, you know, it's like crazy. But then when you see the preparations and you spray the preparation and you see the benefits of that, you start understanding everything better, yeah. you know. And so I think the best way to to understand biodynamics is practicing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about Antiel because you started in 1996 and you bought a, just a hectare of land. I think in Welken, where you are now, with your amazing wife Marina. And if people often talk about Antiel as being Chile's first garage winery, was that true? Yeah, I think so. That was uh, the first garage winery, you know, at that time in 1996 mm. when I started. Uh, the first crop was 1998, but at that time there were the big, big wineries in Chile, you know, the big, big brands, you know, industrial, big houses, you know, mm. and there were nobody doing in the smaller, uh, uh, like bottling, you know, many people maybe in the South, they, they do their wines, but then they sell it bulk to the big wineries that they will bottle. Huh? Yeah. But also some medium wineries were bottling, you know, garrafas, you know, or damajuanas, five, yeah. five, fifteen thousand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, yeah. yeah. But but not bottling bottles of wine that wanted to compete with the big brands in in, uh, in Chile, you know. Mm. Uh, and I think that was uh, the first experience in, in small uh, garage. I started with three tanks. Uh, half and one hectare, hectare of Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah. One hectare, but was with the house and the winery at the end was less than maybe a half hectare <laughs> half of hectare. Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> <laughs> How many hectares do you have now? About 10 or so do you have? 10 with vineyards, 20. Yeah. The, the property here in Maipo is 20 hectares. And uh, yeah, and 10 with vineyards. And we produce around 40,000 bottles, something I mean, like it's, that. It's very much a farm, is it? You were talking about the Steiner concept, if you like, that I that you have to live on in something which is a, an ecosystem. I mean, you, you know, you've got chickens and you've got pigs and you've got horses and, and, and olive trees. I mean, it's a beautiful farm to visit and to live on, I'd imagine, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. At the end, uh, to, to do this type of uh, agriculture, you have to live in the farm and you have to be like a farmer, you know. It cannot be done by... But I would say long distance. Uh, so yeah, we live here. We are happy and, and thanks, thankful to live in, in in a place like that. We have a lot of animals, and uh, yeah, we have different trees. You know, we have uh, habitat breaks uh, between the vineyards, and, uh, and, and, good and music. a lot of life. And always good, good music, music. also. <laughs> With, yeah, always good music. You know, my son. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I visit, and which, which grapes do you, do you grow? Tell us. Is it all? It's mostly the Bordeaux grapes, but a little bit of Syrah. <laughs> Isn't it? 
Yes, mostly, you know, I, I am in Maipo, so so I, I have Cabernet Sauvignon. You have to have Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, I have Carmenere also because my relation with Carmenere and I think with the global warming issue, Carmenere is doing better and better here in Maipo. I have Petit Verdot uh, and I have also uh, not Bordeaux variety like Syrah and Garnacha. So I have also a couple of uh, non, non-Bordeaux non varieties. Yeah, interesting. I mean, t- tell us about your winemaking style, because I like your quote that you said that new technology harks back to the old. In other words, it looks backwards in a way, and you're using things like concrete tanks and and a whole bunch of fermentation. Just tell us how you would describe your winemaking style and maybe how it's changed since you were in Bordeaux. Yeah, well, a lot. It changed a lot. When in Bordeaux, I learned to do wines with a lot of uh, insumes, uh, inputs, you know, mm. and... Uh, and it was maybe the the way that it was booming at that time, you know, the enology science. But uh, yeah, here I try to do in the winery the same that we do in the farm to make wines with minimal inputs. So we were uh, native yeast fermentation, and uh, just I use a, a couple of in, uh, inputs like uh, tartaric acid because I am in a warmer area, mm-hmm. so I need to put some acid to the, especially the carmenere. And uh, sulfites, but yeah, a little everything bit. else, a yeah. little bit of sulfites because in yeah. biodynamics you cannot use a lot. But uh, but I, I I think it helps us to have a consistency in the bottles, so they have a little bit of sulfites also, and nothing else. You know, all the other things are natural. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you've also been a winemaker for a long time, and then you're the consultant at Viñedos Organicos Emiliana, which was part of Santa Emiliana. I think 2000, you joined them, and you've turned it into the biggest organic biodynamic estate in the world with, what, I think nearly 1,100 hectares under vine. How did yeah. you convince the owners, particularly Jose Gilisesti, again, sadly, who died and you mentioned earlier, how did you persuade them to follow your vision at a time when nobody believed in these things? Did they in Chile? I think Jose was... a. Uh... Uh, how you say this? He going, visionary, going anyway. visionary. He he yeah. goes very very far from us. You know, I, I didn't convince him. He, he was already convinced when when uh, I met him. He he went to what else? He, when we start moving organic, the, the the first farm. What else? He told me what else we can do. Yeah. So he was always in the in the in the top of the wave. You know, like. Uh, like getting the the new things, you know. He was uh, very very uh, clever, you know, in that in that way of of, of seeing the, the future and what's what's coming. Uh, so so he was uh, he was pretty convinced, and he was the the driving force uh, in Emiliana that, that that make that everything happens, you know, like like it, what it is Emiliana now, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, mm-hmm. the, the biggest uh, organic and biodynamic producer. But, and you uh, have a great team there as well, don't you? Who worked it was, with you? It was a lot of fun. He was, you, you met Jose. He was always yeah. Yeah. F- uh, funny, like laughing, uh, joking, and uh, but also working a lot. He was very tough working, and, and he was uh, well, he was a, a big a big guy, a big friend. Yeah. Tell me who else you consult for, because you consult for a few people like Perez Cruz, don't you? And, and just tell us who else you work for in Chile. Yeah, but then in, I consult yes uh, in, in enology, you know, in winemaking. I consult uh, Perez Cruz. That's my close uh, winery that we, we, we are neighbors with, with Perez Cruz. Santa Emma, I am working now the last fi- five years. I work a little bit with Casa del Bosque. Uh, I used to work with Unturaga, now less, but sometimes they call me and I go there. Matetic also, sometimes I, I help them. And I have a, a client in, uh, in Uco, in, in, in Argentina, in the Uco Valley. Very that good called, Luna Austral, that uh, yeah. produces a beautiful Cabernet Franc, Malbec, that I work with also. And do you enjoy that side of your life, working with other people? Yeah, yeah, because you are always uh, learning something new. Uh, every every winery you visit, you learn something. And uh, with, with the people that you work also, uh, you are always learning. And uh, and it's fun. I love to to blend. I love to taste wines. And and so it's it's good for me. It's fun. And I think... I, I pass good time with with all my clients and 
I mean, we've, we've learned where you learned about biodynamics and had the influence of people like Paul Dolan, but especially uh, uh, Alan York. People often say you were single-handedly responsible for introducing biodynamic viticulture, not just to Chile, but, but to South America, really. I mean, who were the people who followed on from you? Was it was Rodrigo Soto would he be the first yeah. person? Yeah, maybe Rodrigo was my closest uh, person in, in winemaking and in, uh, in biodynamics, yeah. Yeah, because he, when I was at Carmen, he made his uh, stash, his practice in Carmen, his first mm-hmm. practice in enology, mm-hmm. and he was a great guy and a good worker, and uh, and we 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 seem to have the same ideas, you know. And and uh, when I start having to work, I have some consultancy in California with the Fetzer. I, I used to make the Fet, the Jimmy Fetzer wines, Siago, uh, three vintage, just. Uh, in the 1999, 2000, and 2001. And uh, I went there with Rodrigo. I, I asked Rodrigo to help me there, and he stayed for six months uh, working with the wines. I was at Carmen, so I cannot I have to return. But he stayed working the wines and uh, and having his first experiences. And then I think uh, the people that I work with uh, in Emiliana, you know, many winemakers, uh, Carolina, uh, Fernandez, uh, El Toño Bravo, uh, Noelia, mm-hmm. all those winemakers also were very in now uh, organic and biodynamic farming, and I think uh, it help helps us a lot to to promote uh, and organic. They spread, and they, they spread the word, yeah, as it were. They as spread we the English, word, yeah. and yeah. yeah, and they started doing it in uh, in other places. Also, Julito Batías, you know, Julio uh, Matetich, yeah. yeah, Matetich, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're very modest, but and your achievements are amazing. In 2015, Decanter magazine listed you among one of the 30 leading winemakers in the world. There you are with these very, very famous names. I mean, what do you think great winemakers have in common? I mean, I'm not saying you think you're a great winemaker. I'm telling you, you're a great winemaker. What, what, what is it that makes a, a really good winemaker great? I don't know, Tim. I think uh, the passion, uh, the time that you spend working, I think uh, everything has, it's resuming a lot of a lot of dedication, you know, in, in what you are doing, and you have to love what you are doing to get to to do all that time to 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 that job, you know. So you have to be very passionate about that. But I think also when you get new ideas or you are influenced in, in a good way. Uh, your country or, or the same wine industry, you know, maybe for me, I, I, it was the, the, the organic wine movement, you know, in South America, maybe the Carmenere also helped me. And also, I think we, we produce beautiful wines in, in in my career in Carmen and then in Emiliana with the Coyam and the G and then in Antillal with Antillal, Cuyen. That helps also to, I think, to... And, and you need to be a good taster, don't you? Yeah, but this is like a muscle. Uh, you have to you, you have to work yeah. it. You have to, uh, muscle. <laughs> yeah. you, you have to work it. You know, if you work it, it yeah, you know that team. Yeah. You know that it's it's mostly work. You know, and and, and training, training, yeah. training. But, and also, I think I think one of the things you've done is is to focus people back on the vineyards. And I think a lot of these great winemakers know about vineyards. They're not just people who work in cellars. They also understand the vineyards that, and, and the land they work with. Yeah, I think that's uh, very, very important. You know, the wines are made in the in the vineyards. And what we can do in the cellar is very little. Huh? We, we can, we can, how you say, it, make wrong, you know, a beautiful yeah. uh, uh, grape, but yeah. it's, it's very rarely that it's a bad grape, you will do a good wine, you know. The, the, <laughs> yeah. the wines uh, came in the fields. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, listen, I want to ask you a bit about climate change. You mentioned it's raining today in the Maipo Valley and that you're celebrating because you haven't seen very much rain. I don't know why I'm laughing. I mean, what's happening with Chile? I mean, there's a lot of pressure from the other agricultural sectors on water, isn't there? Water usage, particularly things like, you know, uh, 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 avocados use a lot three times more water w- what's going to happen to Chile over the next 20 years are we going to see more dry farmed vineyards do you think I think the the agricultural is moving to the south uh, most of the especially by example the fruit industry that are very ahead you know in these movements they are going to the south now and uh, yeah we are suffering uh, I think uh, one of the effects of, of global warming here in, in Chile especially in the central valleys you know that mm-hmm. we have a much less rain and when you have less rain less water and uh, and yeah we start seeing all the 
the business that used that water, like the mining, uh, mining mm. business. Chile is a very important mining country mm. and they use a lot of water also. Uh, and uh, yeah, also the fruit industry, as you say, uh, avocados, especially that are mostly in the, in, in this a- area, you know, mm. north of Santiago, mm. uh, that are each year less, less water. So they're suffering also. Um, but I think also we have to do a lot of uh, efforts in uh, in new dams, you know, new work better, uh, the, the short water that we have, uh, managing better, you know. We are not, uh, we, we haven't done in the last years a lot of uh, investment in infrastructure, you know, to to be more efficient in with the water that we have. And I think that's that's coming, you know. That's coming because still. And what, and what about different different grape varieties? You mentioned you you have garnacha, for example. Do you think we'll see more of the Mediterranean grapes being planted in Chile? That they're more drought resistant. I think al- already uh, they, they, we are planting a lot of Mediterranean grapes, especially we also with the development of the Maule and the Tata Valley. You know, the, there are coming different varieties that they used to have there, like Cinso, Carignan, and they are planting garnacha that also they were planted in the past. So it's, I think it's, uh, it's coming, you know, and uh, also they enrich, then we said, enrich yeah. the, the, the culture of the country. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's, it's more, more interesting. And I think it's, we have different type of, mm. of wines also that in the past they weren't like that. They weren't there. But yes, yeah. I think they were planting a lot of uh, Mediterranean grapes here in, in Chile. And I think maybe they will continue. And, and, and have you observed organic and biodynamically farmed vineyards dealing better with drought and with climate change? I think they deal better. They deal better because they have better roots. They are, they have more uh, resilience, uh, and they adapt better to the conditions of the of the place. Mm. Uh, so I think organic is, is 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 a help. You know, when you do this type of farming, yeah. will help to have a more strong plants and more resilient mm. plants. Uh. Mm. Uh, there's something I've been, always wanted to ask you is if, whether you'd like to make wine anywhere else in the world. You've made wine in Bordeaux, you've made wine in Argentina, you've made wine in Chile. Anywhere else, if you could dream, where would you go to make wine? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I am very Italian. I, I love I love my country. I don't like too much to travel. I am, you know, you know, I am very like a house houseman, you know, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't know Portugal, by example. I don't know Portugal. I, I would love it to visit and I would love it to have an experience there, but uh, but I, I haven't done it. Okay, so if there are any of my Portuguese friends listening to this podcast, then they should invite you over to go and do, go and do a vintage, yeah. right? Okay. Because it's a different time of year, different hemisphere, so you could do yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I can do it. That would be fun, yeah. And, and what about getting away from wine? Because I know you have this amazing house in, in Chiloé, which is pretty remote, and you drive down there and it's, what, 12 hours in the car just to get there. But even there, you've planted a vineyard, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> so how do That's you get like, away from know, wine? <laughs> Yeah, you are always uh, experimenting, and uh, that shows you know, the love that you have uh, for the vines. You know, you planted everywhere. Yeah. But uh, yes, I planted like 80, 80 plants, you know, four different uh, varieties, just to see how it works. But uh, they are not working for me very well. And uh, <laughs> now I'm thinking to plant better apples, you know, uh, apples, apples to okay. make cider. <laughs> yeah. How do you get away from wine? Do you, you mean, you like canoeing, don't you? You like reading, you yeah. like music? Yeah, I love music and uh, I love uh, maybe old old kind of music, not the new, but um, I love the rock. Uh, but I I like very much uh, nature. I love I love sports. I love uh, to be, to do kayaking. I am I am an ocean. I, I do a lot of ocean kayak in the fjords, uh, and I love that. You know, I, happily my wife Marina love it also, so we can do it together, and that's a lot of fun. Yeah, we we love to do that, and uh, I. Try to go to Tiloé every two two months. I stay a couple of weeks there, doing those things. You know, Be- beautiful place. So your li- your link with the ocean, which meant you wanted to be a marine biologist at one point. Yeah, you still got you still got the link with the ocean, <laughs> even though we're very lucky that you went into wine, not marine biology. Right? <laughs> at the end, I returned to the to the ocean. You to see. the ocean. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Listen, Albert, it's been fantastic talking to you. I always learn so much from you, particularly talking to you about biodynamics and the way you explain it. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. And I'll see you very soon in Chile or maybe, who knows, Portugal. Yeah, maybe. Thanks. Thanks, Tim, for the for your time. Thanks for the opportunity to, to talk with you and, and happy to to see you by by the computer and see you soon bye (laughs) see ya ciao 
Well, listening to Alvaro Biodynamics makes a lot of sense, and his farm is really worth a visit if you're ever in Chile. Next week on Cork Talk, my guest is Giovanni Manetti from Fortodi in Chianti Classico. Join me then. Thanks for listening to Cork Talk. If you want to read more reports, articles and tasting notes by me, go to my website, timatkin.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Tim Atkin, and on Instagram, at Tim Atkin MW. See you next week.